let me just check. The, I, I don't remember the, the CV of the, the next speaker. So, okay, I think that we can now move to the second uh, keynote of the day. We uh, actually, we change topic, but not so much in the sense that we are moving from biological complexity to, to disease spreading. And in fact, actually for me, it's a great pleasure to present a friend, but also what is most important, one of the most renowned network, young network scientists, yeah, almost young network scientists in the community, <laughs> Professor Jesus Gomez Gardenes from the University of Zaragoza. Thank you for being, thank you for being here. And actually, uh, Professor Gardenes is Associate Professor at the University of Zaragoza, where he also leads probably the lab with the coolest name in the entire complex system community, the Gotham Lab. But most importantly, he's also, um, let's say, one of the most, one of the most leading scientists in the study of dynamical system, dynamical processes on networks, where actually he, he he made many different contributions since the mid 2000s, let's say, from uh, ranging from evolutionary game theory to synchronization and very recently in the theory of uh, spreading processes. And actually, this is the topic of his talk today, because actually he's going to talk about network based interventions to stop dengue propagation. So thank you, Jesus, for being here. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I have, I have, I, I, I hear myself. I think. Okay. No, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Okay. Okay, so everything correct. Thank you very much, Sandro. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much to the organizers, uh, Jose, Sandro, Alberto, which is your fault that I'm here. So all of you, Maxi as well. Uh, thank you for for the invitation. So this is the the the, the serious the serious title of my talk, as as uh, Sandro said, network based interventions to stop dengue propagation. But uh, I prefer much more this one, hunting mosquitoes with networks. So so we have to hunt something which is very very serious. Well, in principle, mosquitoes are annoying, are disturbing. We feel today in uh, in Palma because we have thirty degrees, so we still have a lot of mosquitoes, but also of being annoying, I mean, they are the vector transmitters of uh, a lot of diseases. In fact, you find here names that you know, like Zika, Malaria, Yellow Fever, West Nile, Rift Valley, Dengue, Chikungunya, and all of these vector bone diseases in human cause more than 1 million deaths per year. So they are a serious concern to, to, to global health. Dengue is one of the most important, not in terms of deaths, but in terms of cases. Uh, so they are about more than 100 million of cases per year, uh, symptomatic cases, so there are much more asymptomatic cases. And the important thing is that the projection for the future years is uh, is not very good, okay? So in this paper by Messina and collaborators in 2018, they put a projection and what they say is that in 2018, more than half of the population of the whole here, so more around 60% of the population, will live in areas under the risk and the serious risk of having this kind of diseases and especially dengue, because this is the habitat, the expansion of the habitat to warmer areas of the of the habitat of uh, Aedes aegypti. Why is it? Obviously, global warming plays a role. Obviously, we feel today um, like a summer in Palma. It's not be the case uh, usually. I mean, in the in the past decades, in October, November, also urban growth, especially non-planned growth, in especially in, in in poor countries, and also our increased mobility, human and animal mobility, our increased mobility. Why mobility? I think most of you know why mobility plays a key role in the spread of disease. This is uh, what happened uh, centuries ago. This is the path 
that leprosy, smallpox, and other emerging diseases of that time follow in order to cover several continents. And this is, for instance, the case of uh, bubonic plague. This is a map that most of you know. It took uh, several years. It took almost uh, five years to cover only the European continent, so going from the south of Europe until the north, so in five years. But instead today, what happened is that the time scale associated to mobility is much, much lower than the time scale associated to the infection. So in principle, at that time, you start to, you, you contract the, 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 infection, the pathogen, you start a trip, and you do not end the trip alive, okay? Now, you contract the pathogen, you start a trip, and you can make many, many trips, contain a lot of people, and you spread the pathogen, you can spread the pathogen to a, a lot of people in very different cities, in very different continents with the same infection. So there has been an inversion of this time scale associated to infection and spread. And obviously, you know, this is COVID-19, that in a few weeks, you can cover. So this is January. And then if you go to February, after one month, you see that the whole, the whole world is, uh, is affected by, by this new emerging disease. And it happened the same to vector-borne disease, okay? It happened the same. I mean, for instance, Zika virus was a great concern in 2015. I remember in Brazil, especially in Brazil, Colombia, and these areas, um, was not an emerging disease. In fact, Zika virus was located, you see, in the Pacific Island much before this, uh, this outbreak. And because human mobility, because the importation of several cases simultaneously to a place in which the habitat for Aedes albopictus was uh, ideal, which is the part of Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, etc. This turns into an, an, an outbreak, a big, big outbreak of a disease that existed decades ago. So, in order to study this, uh, the, the importance that mobility has in in general in disease propagation, the typical approach we make, and you know, all of you know, is uh, metapopulation. Let me remind you what a metapopulation is. A metapopulation is a, is a network. Uh, you have nodes and you have links, but here the nodes are, uh, sub, are geographical areas. And it depends on the level of description you are interested in. These areas can be urban areas in a city or cities in a country or countries in a, in, in a continent or a global, in a global perspective, different countries. Okay? So inside each geographical area, you find individuals that interact and also can uh, change. This is a, a, a example in which individuals can adopt free state. So interact and move according to the links that you observe in the network. Okay, so the network that connect nodes dictates or tells you how people move across these geographical areas. Okay, so you have interplay between interaction and mobility or contagion if you are interested in disease propagation and mobility at the same time, thanks to this framework in metapopulation. How we move, or how is mobility in the first order approximation, if you want, in real, in real, in urban areas? So mobility, as you see here, you have a map. This is the city of Medellin in Colombia, and you have in the in the in the top the origin, the the origin of the of the trips, and in the bottom the destination. And we have divided the day during morning, afternoon, and evening. And it's clear that. The origins in the morning corresponds to the destination in the evening. And in the afternoon, you don't see any big difference between the maps of origin and destination. You can say that during a day, most of the trips of the population are, are dictated by, by commuting path. So commuting path seems to be a good approach, a good proxy for a, for a, for a first metapopulation model in order to tackle how a disease propagates across, especially a city or a regional area. So we propose here a very basic model, very basic in, in the most uh, basic um, um, uh, case, okay, which uh, in which have three steps. The first one is movement, okay. So people uh, go from the origin to the destination, let's say to work, for instance. Then there is interaction here, in which people interact and propagate ideas or pathogens, whatever they are interested in. And finally, you have the return, in which you come back destination to the origin okay this is the movement interaction return and these states start again and again and again so you can simulate days days and days different days okay this is the mir model so let me just uh, formulate this uh, model in the simplest uh, in the simplest form so that you can capture 
what is the, the limitations also of the model and what are the assumptions of the model. So in principle, in one patch of the meta population, we have individuals, or uh, arbitrary number of individuals, typically given by the demography of the, of the patch. And if you are, for instance, assuming that uh, the dynamics is uh, ruled by the SIS or the SIR model, then you have the, 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 the contagion process at the microscopic level, at the individual level. So a susceptible agent in contact with an infectious one, with some probability lambda or rate lambda if you are in continuous time, gets infected and infected, turns again into susceptible with some probability mu. Or if you are interested in the SIR, for instance, the susceptible turns infected with probability lambda and infected turns recovered with probability mu. So you start the simulation inside the patch and you, you, you reach the final state, which can be the extinction of the epidemic or endemic state, depending on, on, the, on the precise model you are interested. Okay, so now we have a collection of patches. Okay, so we have this collection of patches. Again, not the number of individuals in each patch is the same. So each patch has a different number of individuals according to demography. And we have a network. We have a network connecting the patches that tells you how people move in this in this area. Okay, so at the beginning of the, oh, also they have a dynamical state. Obviously, each individual is associated to a dynamical state. In the simplest case, in the in the SIS model, healthy or infected. If you have more refined compartmental models, as many compartments as you as you need. Okay, so at the beginning of the day, a fraction p uh, move, or if you want. Each agent moves with some probability p, and they move according to some to, to the network. And the network is equipped by weights, so it's a directed and weighted network that tells you the probability that one resident in a patch I moves to another patch J. Okay, so according to this probability, people change the the location and they interact. They update their state according to the rules, the rules of the of the compartmental model. And finally, they come back again. So this is the most basic model for putting together contagion rules and also commuting patterns. Okay, so you can consider the this is the, the parameters of the model, and you can construct equations. Okay, if you are if you are um, working with the SIS model, then you need a set of n variables. Okay, this this rho sub i, which are the fraction of infected individuals that you have in each patch, residence in patch. And if you are interested in the SIR, you need an, an additional pool of, uh, of variables, which are this R sub I, which is the fraction of recovery individuals associated to patch I, which are residents in patch I, not places, but residents of patch I. So let's, let's keep uh, this formulation as simple as possible. So we, we take the SIS model, and then the evolution equation are really, really simple, are these equations, okay? So you have how the fraction of individuals, the infected individuals resident in patch I will be tomorrow as a function of the residents, uh, the, the infected residents in other patches at time T. So tomorrow you will have that uh, the fraction of infected individuals tomorrow at patch I will be the fraction today times the probability that they don't recover plus the fraction of health individuals in this case plus, uh, sorry, times the probability that they, they, they get the disease, which is this probability, the probability that a healthy individual resident in, with residence in patch I is infected at time T, okay? So this probability have two terms, the probability of getting the infection when you don't move at your own patch and the probability of getting the, the infection in the destination node, okay? So this here appears this matrix, the matrix RIJ, okay, that uh, encodes all the They are the probability that being in patch I at time T, a healthy individual is infected. And this probability is that you are in patch I and you have to consider all the possible interactions with all the people that you meet at patch I, okay? So if you are in patch I, you could meet residents of patch I, but you, need, you meet also visitors that belong to other patches that are currently in the same patch. So you have to consider the number of infected people that go for all the patches, yay, and meet there. Okay, so you have these equations, and the important thing of these equations, apart to the form, is that it con they contain different parameters, obviously mu and lambda here, which are the epidemiological parameters. You have this NI, that capture the demography, the actual demography of your of your meta population, and 
the values of the weights of your mobility matrix, which is this matrix R, okay? And obviously the fraction of people that move, which tells you it's a control parameter that allows you to explore what's the influence of mobility in your, in your net. So here, the relevant question is given a population, given a, a population that you, model as a metapopulation with some heterogeneous demographic partition or distribution and mobility patterns. What's the influence of mobility P? Okay. So you take the questions and you consider the, well, what we know to do, which is the linearization of these highly nonlinear equations in order to compute the epidemic threshold. The epidemic threshold, which is the minimum infectivity that you need to trigger the epidemic, okay? And obviously what you get is something related to the maximum eigenvalue of a matrix, which in this case is a matrix M, which we call the mixing matrix. And the important thing here is that the missing matrix contains a non-trivial interplay between demography, mobility, and also the, the, the restriction to mobility, which is P, okay? Has the first term here tells you the mixing of uh, individuals from patch E with other with peoples of the same patch I. That's why this is that this the delta is here. The second term tells you the, the, the mixing of individuals from patch I with other people from patch A when they meet either at patch I or at patch A. So I'm visiting one friend or my friend is visiting me, my residence. And finally, the third term that goes with P to the square accounts for the mixing of individuals, two individuals from different patches in a third patch. So like here, we meet here in Panama, but Marta comes from Berkeley, I come from Zaragoza, etc., etc. So these are two contagions that can happen in this metapopulation. And if you study how this epidemic threshold through the computation of this matrix uh, behaves, what you see is that there is a non-trivial behavior according to mobility. So you expect that the more we move, the, the larger P, the less, the, the lower, the, the smaller the, the epidemic threshold. But it's not the case. In fact, there is no, there is no, uh, there is no behavior. There is no universal behavior. You can find this, which is you you have that for very low mobility values, what you have is that the epidemic threshold increase, okay? Then you find that you, the, the, the expected decrease, but this non-trivial behavior leads to what we call epidemic detriment, okay? This is for the city of Cali, but if you go to other cities and we remain in Colombia, we like Colombia, so we go to, to Medellin and Bogota, what you find is another behavior, which we call type three. Obviously you can find also type one, which is that the, the epidemic threshold goes and decreases smoothly with P, which is what you expect. But in general, this is not the most general behavior, okay? This is not the, 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 the most usual scenario. The most usual scenario is this type two or type three. And this is something that we found some years ago together in collaboration with David, which is here, and Alex Arenas in, in Tarragona, and that we further explored for many, many cities in the world in order to inspect their vulnerability, okay? This diagram, the, what's the behavior uh, across very different countries, okay? So our conclusion is that in terms of how on a spreading phenomenon like this one, is that there is no universal behavior and that you need to study precisely what's the distribution of the people living in a city and how they move across the city in order to propose containment policy. So because it can happen that some policy can be very good for a city and the same policy can be very bad, very detrimental for another one. Why? Because the anatomy, the skeleton of mobility and demography is the way the second, the second work is uh, done with Gurab, which is also in the audience. So I don't want to, I don't want to forget to mention him. So with this model, we refine this model and obviously propose many modifications in order to adapt to data. Data impose you more restrictions, more, more degrees of freedom, and you can adapt this model in order to go to go more close to reality. Obviously we applied it to COVID, but today let me focus after this brief presentation in Dengue. Okay. To present one of his works after this, uh, this keynote uh, session. So if you are interested, you can remain in this, in this, uh, in this place. So let's catch mosquito. Now we have demography, we have mobility, and now we have an
okay? Single patch, this is a single, a single patch. We have a collection of humans and mosquitoes. So there are NM mosquitoes and NH humans. And there is some beta, which is the, 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 the number of bites that a mosquito, a typical mosquito day per day, okay? Per unit time, which is here the day. Here, the important, uh, an, a, an important parameter is uh, the fraction of mosquitoes per human, this, uh, this gamma, on how many mosquitoes are per human. You imagine, I mean, here in this room, uh, we are a lot of people, and there is one single mosquito. I mean, you have to, you have to be very, very, very bad luck if uh, you contract the disease because, because of the bite of this single mosquito. But if the situation is the opposite, if there are 300 mosquitoes and I, you are the single person, I think that the chances that you get a bite and maybe con this gamma is very, very important, as you imagine. So the rules are very, very simple. So a healthy human, in, uh, it's bit, when it's bitten by an infected mosquito, this healthy human can contract the disease with some probability lambda image. And then if a mosquito, if a healthy, sorry, an infected human, then it can carry the virus, here dengue virus with some probability lambda chain. In principle, they are not the same, okay? It's smaller than the other case that we transmit the disease to the mosquito, okay? So, and there are two parameters of recovery, infected humans go to healthy and infected mosquitoes do not go to susceptible because they are carriers for the whole life, but they are replaced by healthy mosquitoes. The, the, the dengue virus is transmitted uh, vertically, so it's not transmitted from the mother to the offspring, but it's just replaced by healthy mosquitoes. Infected mosquitoes are replaced by healthy mosquitoes. So this mu M is associated to the lifespan of, uh, of a typical mosquito. So with these uh, basic rules and these variables, uh, which are the fraction of infected humans and the fraction of infected mosquitoes, you can construct equations, these two kind of terms. The You, what you do is to go to the stationary state, analyze the stationary state of these equations. Remember, this is for a single patch. Analyze the linear regime in which, in which uh, the incidence for mosquitoes and humans is very, very small. And finally, you deal with this condition. This, uh, when this combination of parameters, when this formula is larger than one, then you will find an outbreak. In, in this case, a dengue outbreak. Otherwise, you are safe and in your system, even there are some mosquitoes or infected humans, the epidemic will die out, okay? This is the, the typical So let's go to the metapopulation. So now we have our MIR model for the metapopulation plus the Ross McDonald model. Okay, let's see. So in this case, we have again in this different cities or different urban area, different districts with the population of humans and mosquitoes. And the population of humans and mosquitoes are uh, casted in these vectors N and M. So then mosquitoes are according to the Ross McDonald.
still to a fraction of, with the fraction of infected inf uh, humans and infected mosquitoes, but to the total number of infected humans residents in I and the number of, and the total number of infected mosquitoes in I. So these are now my two my two um, variables for each patch, and we can write the equations again. We have the two terms: the recovery or for mosquitoes and humans, and finally in the sec the second term, which is the contagion the contagion probabilities. Okay, in this case, the contagion probabilities are very similar to the Meyer model. You can be a resident of patch I, can contract the disease either because he stays uh, at home with some probability P sub I, or either because he visits or she visits another patch and then with some probability PJ, he contracts the disease. These probabilities in this case, remember that here contagions depends on the number of mosquitoes that you find in the patch you are visiting and the biting probability of the mosquitoes are given by this expression in which you have this quantity, which is the effective number of uh, humans in patch A, which depends on the, um, on the mobility, on the mobility P and also on the matrix R. Here we have another contribution, which is this alpha, which is the degree of symptomaticity. So remember that dengue has a large fraction of infections that are asymptomatic, then you have to take it those into consideration. When you are symptomatic, you don't move. When you are asymptomatic, you are free to move, okay? We consider this situation as well. This is for the, this probability for the mosquitoes is really, really simple. And for the mosquitoes is just this expression. A mosquito bites per day just beta times. And here what you find with lambda is just the probability that the one of these bites is going to a person which is infected. So you need this quantity, which is the effective number of humans infected that the mosquito will find at the patch, okay? And again, depends on the people that live in this patch and also the people that visit the patch of the mosquito, obviously. Okay, so we have the ingredients you see are very similar in the spirit to the Meyer model. And then what you do is to find the epidemic threshold. Remember that the epidemic threshold for the gross McDonald compartmental model was this quantity that I have, you have uh, at the bottom. And if you perform, obviously, the linearization of this equation, for the Ross McDonald model in a meta population, what you find is this expression. Okay. And again, you see that depends obviously on epidemiological parameters, but also on the largest eigenvalue of another matrix, this M M tilde matrix. Okay. This M M tilde matrix plays the same role as the, but is the product of these two single matrices. By now, I'm not going to explain what are the meaning of this matrix. We will come back later in two minutes, okay? But just remember that everything depends on the spectral radius in the larger eigen the largest eigenvalue of the product of two matrices, M and M tilde. Okay, so let's apply, let's apply and, and validate the model in a real meta population, and we go again to Santiago de Cali. Why Santiago de Cali? Well, Santiago de Cali, I think you know perfectly. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a big city in Colombia, the third largest city in Colombia. It's more than 2 million of uh, population. It's divided in 22 neighborhoods or districts, which are called comunas. And we have a collection at that time of, uh, of uh, a lot of trajectories. Now we have better data. So the important thing in Cali is that dengue is endemic. So every time you go to Cali, the probability that you contract dengue is not is not zero, okay? There is always an endemic channel of dengue. And in fact, in Cali, you find that the four possible serotypes of dengue are running across the city all the time, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a very big problem for, 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 for these places. So we consider um, our model and we consider different scenario. Here I show, I show you one, which is a simulation in which we start with some, um, we consider, sorry, the real, Okay. No, don't. okay, we consider the real parameters for the Cali, which are calibrated by the epidemiologists there. So we have the value of uh, beta, of lambdas, and mu. We consider also the spatial distribution of mosquito, or ecologists, and we also impose that the degree of mobility is the one that we observe in the city, which is 0 0.36. And we start the epidemic by putting some kind of, uh, some number of infected mosquitoes in this area, which is an area which is it's not very well connected to the city. So we want to see how the epidemic is spread from an isolated area in, 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 the whole, in the whole city. So this is what we 
we obtain with some Monte Carlo simulation. So just putting all the mosquitoes and all the humans interacting. Okay, so here is an agent-based model in which you can have control of every movement of every individual, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what you see is that everything starts in the in patch 20, and it takes a while. It takes a while in order to start spreading to other patches. But one it start spreading to other patches effectively spreads over all the city okay and finally you reach a stationary state okay that can be the endemic state of the city what tells you the effective equations that we derive it uh, well it's a almost perfect agreement not only in the stationary state but also in the um, in the um, transient regime which is very important if you are interested in see how the evolution from an initial seed, from an initial uh, very small outbreak uh, happen in the in the city. And what's more important is that if we consider the stationary state and we go to the to the patches that are most affected, that are more affected sorry, by the by the disease, what we see is that we have a collection that are patches 16, 13, and 14. And if we compare with real, with the real, with the real um, pattern of the gains, it coincides very, very well with the with the patterns observed in reality. So the the framework the framework is uh, the framework is um, working very well. So let me go back to the equations and say, okay, we can do better. We can use the information of the epidemic threshold. We can use the information of the mixing matrix in order to do something without any kind of simulation, not even Monte Carlo, not even Markov, which are very computationally safe. And so we go back to the mixing matrix, and now we explain which are these two matrix that form the mixing matrix of the, of the system. The first one is tells you how one individual from patch I is affected by vectors from patch J. And the second one is how a mosquito, how a vector from patch I is affected from individuals from individuals that are infected from patch J. So taking into consideration the multiplication of these two matrices, what happened is that the mixing matrix that rules the eigenvector, the epidemic threshold of our metapopulation is just the influence of the individuals of patch J over an individual of patch I. Remember that here contagions are vector individual, vector individual. So what we are doing this is bridging all the possible contagion pathways via vectors in order to see how individuals can affect others. So an effective contagion individual to individual, integrating all the possibilities that goes through vectors, okay? So once we have this, we can compute a kind of epidemic risk of a patch, which, con which is just this, uh, this, this influence of the individuals from each patch J of a single individual in patch I, so we multiply by the total number of individuals in patch N, okay? So we have an epidemic risk. And if we compare this risk that we derive just from the, make, from the mixing patterns with the real, the real, um, in, um, the real incidence across uh, the city of Cali, what we see is a very, very good agreement. Remember, these are without any simulations, only with information encoded with the matrix that obviously you obtain from a dynamical process, okay? Okay, so it seems that the formalis works very well, not only for simulations, but also with the with information at hand in the mixing matrix. So can we help? That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the big question. It is very good for, for a point of view from a mathematician, for a physicist, but can we help? In Cali, and not only in Cali, but also in, in, in different parts of Asia, is the World Mosquito Program, which is trying to immunize with, uh, with the help of a bacteria called Volvacia. Okay, I think that many of you know what Volvacia is. And they are trying to immunize certain uh, districts of this map that I saw you, okay? What is, uh, in fact, they are trying to immunize, uh, we, we come back to the numbers. What's the biological control with Volvacia? Volvacia is a bacteria that live in many, many arthropods, okay? But not in Aedes aegypti, not in Aedes albopictus, okay? Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti are free of Volvacia in the wild type. What happened with Volvacia? Wild type, uh, mosquito uh, is taken, well, the eggs of this wild type mosquito are taken, they are take into the lab and through a microinjection, this bacteria, uh, Volvacia, is inserted in each of these. And then with these eggs, you release in the habitat, in the natural environment of this mosquito. And if you are lucky, you have this Volvacia 
chiacarin mosquito, okay? Why do we want to put Borbachia bacteria in a mosquito? Well, the big, the, the, the big um, good news is, the, is this. A wild-time mosquito, an infected wild-time mosquito in contact with a human, we know that can produce uh, an infection. But a Borbachia carrying mosquito infected with dengue in contact with human do not produce an infection, which is really nice. Okay, This is the very big and important good news. But these are very expensive. I mean, you have to go to the lab, insert the Borbachia in each egg, and then release. The thing is that once you to release these Bolbachia infected eggs and they and they hatch. What happens? Wild type mosquitoes, okay, that are present in the natural habitat. And these are the, the, the very big, the very good news. You have this mating matrix in which you have uh, female and male uh, wild type and Bolbachia male and a male <laughs> meet. The offspring have no Bolbachia, are wild type. If a female and a male with Volvacia meet, what happens is that the offspring carry Volvacia, which is something that is very important. So Volvacia offspring will be preserved across ages. What happens in when they mix in different types? Well, here you have that if a, if a, if a female with Volvacia meet with a mate with, with a male with Volvacia, the offspring have Volvacia. But the thing is even better, because when a female with South Volvacia meets with a male with Volvacia, they don't have offspring, okay? So clearly, there is an evolutionary advantage for Volvacia carrying mosquitoes in order to outcompete wild type mosquitoes. If we put it in the equations, because we like equations, what you have is the typical of Cavaltura uh, model with competition, in which wild type mosquitoes have this term, Neglecting the um, neglect uh, that, that that capture the fact that wild type mosquito need to find other wild type mosquito in order to have offspring, which is not present in the Volvacia, in the evolution of the Volvacia. I mean, the solution is evident. Here is the face portrait, and you have here the total population of uh, wild type mosquito, the total population of Volvacia type mosquito, and you see what happened. If you start in any place of the of the face portrait at the end what happened is that the population is completely taken over by Volvacia mosquitoes okay so this is the, the the very the very good news okay so here if you want to consider this you have to consider now not only the number of infected mosquitoes but also the number of white type mosquitoes the number of Volvacia mosquitoes and obviously the number of infected mosquitoes with dengue in order to put the Ross McDonald model interplaying with this with this um with this uh, competition dynamics. If you go into the metapopulation, obviously this depends on the patch. And if you finally couple this with the Ross McDonald in a metapopulation, what you have is this set of four equations for each of the patches in your metapopulation. What you have is then the evolution for the infected humans, the evolution for the infected mosquitoes, but also the evolution of the wild type mosquitoes and the evolution for the Bolvacia carrying mosquitoes. What happened? Well. Let's see. Here, what you have is the evolution of the incident without any control. So you start by a, a very small amount of human of uh, infected humans, and after a while, you reach a steady state incident without any control. Now imagine that we put some kind of uh, control, some kind of intervention, putting Volvacia in the system. Okay. Let's imagine that we are very rich. We have a lot of people. We have a lot of labs, so we can put a lot of Volvacia in all the districts of Cali, okay, of the city. Obviously, what happened is that the infections die out because no mosquito, no wild type mosquito remains in the population. But we are not rich, as I tell you. These are limited resources that need to go to the lab and carefully release in the habitat. So you have to decide. You have, let's say, 100 of the, these mosquitoes, and you have to decide in which part you put it. Remember this that I showed you before, in which they say that they are acting in these uh, districts, communas 1, 18, 19, and 20. Let's see what happened according to this, uh, to this uh, model. If you go and immunize 19, this is what happened. You don't see nothing. Well, there is something here that you don't see. Uh, just, just, uh, 
behind the, the black hole. If you go to node 20, well, you see that, yeah, there is some small decrease in the incidence. If you go to patch uh, one, well, a little bit better. And finally, if you go to patch 18, a little bit better, okay? So it seems that for the last two, okay, for the last two patches, there is a decrease in the incidence, which is okay. But the thing is, can we do something with the mathematics that we have developed that it seems to to, to to perform good. So we come back to our mixing matrix and remember that this is a matrix that the eigen value tells you how the epidemic threshold behave, but also have an associated eigen vector by the Perron Frobenio theorem. It has all these positive entries and you can use it for, for ranking. And you can rank the patches according to the importance for the for the for the epidemic. So we go to the leading eigen vector of this of this mixing matrix, which is this one, and then it's very localized. If you compute the inverse participation ratio, it's really, really large. So at the end, what happened is that this eigenvalue is telling you, hey, you have to immunize patch 13. Yeah, 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 yeah. One minute. I mean, this is by two minutes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You have to immunize patch 13, and if you immunize patch 13, what happened is the following. Wow, I mean, this is a very, very good result. Okay, then you can do, and you can say, okay, which are the second and the third patches that I have to, to immunize if I have a little bit more Borbachia, okay? And you say, okay, you have 16 and 20. 21 is the second one, and 16 is the third one. Well, if you go to 21 and you immunize 13 and 21, what you see is this one. Okay, much better. Okay, you immunize the second one and you perform much better. But what happens if I immunize the first and the third one, which is 13 and 16? This happened this. Even better. Why? Because when I immunize the first patch, what I'm immunizing are the mosquitoes of this patch, but also I'm indirectly immunizing all the people that travel often to this patch. So what I have to do in order to compute the second patch to immunize is to recompute the eigenvalue back of a matrix in which I have removed the patch that I immunized, which is a restricted matrix. If I do this and I remove the row and the column 13 of this matrix, what I, what I obtain is that the second patch to immunize is actually patch 16, okay? You can do it, you can do it, you can do it, and this is the way you can decide, you can construct the rank in order to immunize the patch. Importantly, what they see, and now we are in contact with them, is that in April, they decide just to immunize patch 13 and patch 16. So after immunizes this one, 18, 19, and 20, the results were not very good, and they, they say. So they decide to immunize just the first and the second row. So it seems that this can help in order to get the decisions of immunize. Obviously, we need more information, but with the information at hand, it seems that this is the correct situation. So just to finish, uh, well, this is a general. In general, the, this framework is, um, is valid for any kind of disease that you want to, to analyze. Use arbitrary sizes of the uh, populations, arbitrary networks. The, be the better data you have, the better the model will do. I mean, you can insert many, many aspects of the of your data about interaction and mobility in this model from scratch, and it's very, very fast because it's really, really cheap compared to agent-based model simulations. And the most important things, and this is the take-home message, is that it allows for some analytical insights from the mixing matrix. You don't even need to do simulations. You just analyzing the spectral properties of this matrix, you can obtain very, very insightful uh, results to assess epidemic risk, to, assess, to, to evaluate epidemic threshold, and even to help targeting those critical areas that you need to immunize. And well, I, don't, I don't want to show you this. This is another possibility in order to apply control theory. So what I want to do now is to thank the real hunters, which is David Soriano, which is here, Adriana Reina in Zaragoza, and Eliana Arias in Cali. Also, these young, these are really young researchers, not me. 
Hector Jairo Martinez, that happens to be a medical doctor and a mathematician. He's happy with it, as you can see from the picture. And Sandra Meloni, that maybe you have identified as the chairman of the session. Okay, so thank you to these guys. And these are the references. And if I have one minute, Sandro, please. <laughs> I want to announce a conference that is back after the pandemic. So some of you here knows this, this uh, in started um, in 2006, the Latin American Conference of Complex Networks. The first edition was in Puebla in 2017. The second edition was in Cartagena in 2019 in a very nice edition, many people. The idea of this company is to approach complexity and network science to Latin America in a way that students there can meet in a place close to their, to their homes, to their countries, and have interactions with uh, very close interactions with professors. <laughs> we are not so lucky. We'll be very close. We'll be in Cusco, in Peru. Okay, so it's, uh, I mean, if you go there and please go there, you are cordially invited. It's mandatory to, 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 to use two days after the conference, after the conference, after you get habituated to the hike, to, to explore Machu Picchu and keep the dates. It's August 21 to 25. We are just uh, finishing all the announcements, but Stay tuned, uh, stay tuned by, by Twitter. We will announce very, very soon registration, submission, etc. So now, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Jesus also for the very inspiring talk from the tech, uh, the modeling point of view also to the applications. Okay, since I see that actually you are running away for the coffee break, time for just one very quick question. Otherwise, very, very quick question. No one, okay. Yeah, that, over there. Three. No. Okay, I Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, just a question. Uh, what about the seasonality of uh, mosquito population in the model? Uh, it appears to me that you didn't consider, but does it going to have an effect or, or not? If you are if you are interested in forecasting, yes, and you can do it. I mean, you can put. In fact, we we have some models in which you can put a kind of forcing in the in the beta, which is the biting rate, because biting rate depends a lot on the temperature and the humidity and. It's usually observed that after a rainy season, you observe a peak in dengue. If you are interested in forecasting, you can put it into the model. But if you are interested in some intervention acting on the endemic channels, then you, in principle, you don't need. Because seasonality tells you, okay, the, the, the ranking will be preserved, but the, the thing is that the incident will grow in the same way for all the, for all the, for all the patches in your meta population here in Cali, for instance, or in, in another place. So yeah, you can put it. But here, in, for, our, for our interest, we don't put it because it's, it's irrelevant for our purposes. Thank you. Okay, so I think that actually we can wrap up. Let's thank the speaker, the speaker again. And now you can run for the coffee break. Thank you so much.